think we'll get started here. I'll start by introducing myself and then I'll introduce our um, professor that we have with us today, Professor Jeremy Larson. So I am Taryn Murphy. I am the digital marketing manager at the Classic Learning Test, CLT. I'm super excited to be with you all tonight. This is the sixth installment in our journey through the Author Bank series, which was launched only about over a month ago. And this seminar series was, was inspired by our author bank at CLT, um, which is, you know, the great authors and texts that we draw from, from for our standardized test. And uh, you may or may not be familiar with CLT, but we are a standardized testing and assessment company. And I think when a lot of people hear the word standardized test, they get the chills, the heebie-jeebies, but CLT was conceived as a company that would change that. And the mission of CLT is to create a meaningful, beautiful standardized test. And those are not oxymorons. They can coexist. And I just started working for CLT right after college, which was about six months ago. So I'm a recent college graduate. The SAT and the ACT are still, you know, prominent in my mind. And I wish I'd known about the CLT. Um, but I do remember, you know, being quite stressed about taking these exams. And I was a homeschool student. So kind of felt like it was taking away from my education, not really pairing well with it. Um, but the CLT is designed to incorporate um, the texts and authors that have shaped history and culture and authors like John Milton, like we'll be talking about tonight. So I'm just going to take a few moments to talk about the author bank and talk about why, you know, these authors have influenced um, history and culture and why we like to talk about them at CLT. So I'm just going to share my screen here. So hope everybody can see this. And this is our author bank. And as you can see, we've got all kinds of people on this author bank. We have Avicenna, that's a medieval philosopher. We have James Madison, Herman Melville, author of Moby Dick, uh, Chaucer. So, you know, the list goes on and on. And these are authors that CLT has thoughtfully um, drawn from the great books canon and that we wish to use on our exam. All of our reading passages or majority of them are drawn from these authors. And we want to put students in front of these influential texts because whether we know it or not, they have shaped our history, they've shaped our lives. And many of modern society's problems have already been answered by people that lived hundreds or thousands of years ago and were wrestling with the very same things that we are today. So that's my little spiel about CLT, what we do here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then I'll go back to speaker view. All right. And now I want to introduce Professor Jeremy Larson, who we have with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Jared. Oh, sure. Happy to be here. Very happy to have you. So uh, Professor Jeremy Larson has his PhD from Baylor University, and he is an assistant professor at Regent University. He specializes in 17th century literature, and he has published book reviews for the Gospel Coalition, Christianity and Literature, Modern Reformation, and Myth Lore. And he has contributed chapters to Books on Paradise Lost by John Milton and Young Adult Fiction. And he lives with his family in Virginia Beach. So Jeremy, I'll just hand it over to you. Um, I am so excited to hear your presentation. If you want to share a couple more words about yourself, just go for it. Sure. Well, thank you for that introduction. And thank you for all of you uh, for joining me today. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Does that look right? That looks great. You guys can see that? Okay. Well, um, I love Milton. 
And uh, I hope this is as fun for you as it is for me. I wanna just go through a brief sketch of Milton's life first. You can see his years there. And let me see here. I think I'm maybe pushing the buttons too fast here. Let's try that again. Well, there we go. Okay, caught up with me. <laughs> Looks great. So he was born in 1608, died in 1674. So his life spanned much of the 17th century. And just for context, you can see that Edmund Spencer, the author of The Fairy Queen, died in 1599. Elizabeth I died in 1603. And the King James Version of the Bible was published in 1611. William Shakespeare died in 1616, and John Donne and George Herbert, both poet priests, died in the 1630s. So Milton is coming of age during the golden age of English literature, which is why, you know, all the cool kids study the 17th century. So according to Milton himself, he stayed up very late studying. Uh, his own brother even confirmed this years later as a boy, and, and that's like age 12. He would stay up till midnight or one o'clock, and that's pretty intense for a 12-year-old boy. Um, he went to St. Paul's School and eventually Christ's College at Cambridge University. When he was 21, he wrote a Christmas poem titled On the Morning of Christ's Nativity, in which some fallen angels who have become the pagan gods flee from their temples shrieking at the advent of the new baby king. And I love that poem. And unfortunately, we're not gonna spend time talking about it today. We're gonna talk about two other poems that Milton wrote. After graduating with his MA from Cambridge, Milton studied on his own for about five years and uh, toward the end of that time, one of his friends from Cambridge, Edward King, drowned, and Milton wrote a poem titled Lycidas as an elegy for his friend. And we'll take a look at Lycidas in just a few minutes. And for about a year, Milton toured the western part of Europe, meeting people such as Galileo, who was on house arrest at the time, and then he returned to London. And back in London, he tried teaching for a little bit, but it didn't go too well. He got married and had several children, and he began writing on issues related to church and civil government. One of those works was a treatise titled Areopagitica, published in 1644. And this treatise was written in response to Parliament's 1643 licensing order which introduced a pre-publication censorship that Milton strongly objected to. Simply put, no one was supposed to publish anything in England without having checked it first by a committee. And one of Milton's main arguments is that dangerous ideas don't have to destroy you. In fact, they could strengthen you. Here's Milton's own summary of Areopagitica published in another prose work about a decade later. He said, I wrote on the model of a genuine speech, the Areopagitica concerning freedom of the press, that the judgment of truth and falsehood, what should be printed and what should be suppressed, ought not to be in the hands of a few men, and these men mostly ignorant and of vulgar discernment, charged with the inspection of books at whose will or whim virtually everyone is prevented from publishing anything that surpasses the understanding of the mob. So that's Milton's own description of it. Areopagitica has become one of the foundational texts, even in the United States, for discussions of censorship and freedom of speech. And that was in the 1640s, during which the English Civil War occurred. And by the end of that decade, the king, Charles I, was publicly executed by parliament. So pretty dramatic time in world history. In the 1650s, England was a commonwealth. 
governed as a republic. And during this time, Milton went completely blind, which the royalists claimed was God's punishment for Milton's siding against the Stuart monarchy. Also in the 1650s, Milton's first wife died and he remarried, although his second wife died less than two years later. And he married his third wife in 1633, about a decade before he died. In the 1660s, with the restoration of the monarchy, Milton was imprisoned briefly and could have lost his life if it hadn't been for the um, intervention of powerful friends. He eventually published Paradise Lost in 10 books in 1667, then in 12 books in 1674, the year he died. Just a few years before his death, he published a volume containing both Paradise Regained and Samson Agonistes. Paradise Regained is a shorter epic in four books and Samson Agonistes is a tragic play on the final moments of Samson's life. I just wanna cover quickly several reasons that I'm attracted to Milton's work. One of the main reasons is that his poetry and his prose give you a glimpse of a truly gifted mind. Even if you don't understand everything and say Paradise Lost and you won't, there's still something delightful and awe-inspiring in experiencing the grandeur of it. Another reason that Milton's work is so attractive is that even if I can't wrap my mind around all of it, the parts that I do understand are so enjoyable and instructive. I recently read through some of Milton's shorter works aloud with some students, and it was such an enjoyable experience. Um, I gained an even deeper appreciation for Milton as a poet, because when you read it aloud, you slow down and you can actually taste the words and hear the music of the poetry instead of just reading it silently and academically. So his work is enjoyable. He's a very good poet, but it's also instructive. There's so much wisdom in Milton's work that you could easily spend a lifetime trying to unpack all there is to learn there. And a final reason that I love Milton's work, and these are not all perfectly distinct reasons, is that Milton does expertly what the best Christians throughout history have done, which is to appropriate God's truth wherever they find it. Truth such as philosophy, mathematics, epic poetry, and they transform it into the service of the one true God. And maybe we'll have a minute or two to talk about how Milton transforms the genre of epic poetry. So that's a brief Milton biography, plus a few reasons I'm attracted to his work. So let's move on to one of his early poetic works written and published in the late 30s. And this is the pastoral elegy, Lycidas. It was understood that serious poets would begin with an apprenticeship to Virgil, as it were, by writing pastoral poetry first, and then working up to writing epic poetry. And this path to poetic greatness comes from Virgil, who began his career by writing simpler pastoral poetry in a simple style, before writing his complex epic poem, the Aeneid, in a high style. In 16th century England, Edmund Spencer followed that path by writing his Shepherd's Calendar before writing his Fairy Queen. And Milton does the same thing in the 17th century. In fact, writing pastoral poetry could be construed as a poet's announcement of his goal to write an epic one day. So here's Milton, not just writing pastoral poetry, but also perhaps announcing his aspirations to write an epic poem. The poem is titled Lycidas, and it's almost 200 lines long. And you can see in the picture to the right that uh, there's a reference to someone named Lycidas in line eight. Lycidas was a common name in pastoral poetry. Uh, in fact, even in one of Virgil's eclogues, um, his ninth eclogue, a character named Lycidas appears. And as I've mentioned, the occasion for this poem was the drowning of Edward King, um, accidental drowning on a shipwreck. Um, he was a promising Cambridge student studying for the pastoral ministry and King was only 25 years old. 
The poem was written in 1637, just a few months after King died when Milton was 29, and it was published the next year. And the poem begins with a singer or a poet claiming that he's not really qualified to sing well enough for this departed young man, but someone really needs to do it. And almost a third of the poem is a back and forth between the poets challenging the procession of mourners who are certain personified forces of nature who, who really should have protected Lycidas and the replies of those accused personifications as they defend themselves. And some of the mourners include sea nymphs and the sea god Triton. So obviously folks connected to the sea. But about an eighth of the poem is lines spoken by the apostle Peter, which may seem like a strange intrusion in a pastoral poem about a young man who has died. However, there are all several strong connections to Peter. First, as a fisherman, Peter was familiar with water and the sea and its dangers. And you probably remember the story of Peter walking on water. As you also probably know, if you have a good classical education, which should include Bible education, you know that Peter was given the keys to open and close heaven's gates, which is an important matter when you're considering the death of a young person. In addition, as a church leader in Rome, Peter was familiar with the pastoral or shepherding ministry, which is what Edward King was preparing for. And Milton takes this time with Peter speaking to criticize shepherds, that is pastors, who rather than genuinely caring for their flocks, seek advancement and ease. This was a problem that Milton was confronting. In a head note to the poem, which was added later, you can see it there, this did not uh, appear in the original edition. Milton says that he is foretelling, he's got this prophetic role uh, as he's foretelling the, ru the ruin of our corrupted clergy then in their height. And it may seem inappropriate to use the death of a young man to criticize corrupt clergy, but there was a tradition for pastoral poetry to function as satire or a correction. And the poem ends in a very interesting way. The entire poem up through line 185 has been the story sung by a shepherd singing this elegy. But in the final eight lines, we finally see the shepherd himself, almost like in a movie, you hear the narrator the whole time. And then at the end, the narrator steps in front of the camera and you can see who has been speaking the whole time. And he rises from the hillside and twitches his blue mantle over his shoulder as the sun sets and he walks away. He has sung his mournful song all day, but as he walks away into the night, he departs in hope for just as the sun sinks into the water, yet will rise again. The shepherd, the singer remains hopeful that the good shepherd who has walked on water and who has risen from the grave will sustain his sheep through their times of darkness. There's about a 30 year gap between Lycidas and Paradise Lost, but I can't cover all of Milton's works today. So we're gonna skip right to his magnum opus, Paradise Lost. It's an epic poem with more than 10,000 lines of blank verse poetry. And that's poetry that is written in unrhymed iambic pentameter. And before getting too much further, let me suggest a helpful com uh, comprehension tool for those of you hoping to untangle the syntax of Paradise Lost. Some of you may have tried to read it before and it's just really intimidating. Dennis Danielson uh, is a Milton scholar who has uh, written a parallel prose edition of the poem with Milton's poetry on one side of the page and a, a kind of translation into prose on the other side. And I referred to this book as I was writing my dissertation on Paradise Lost at Baylor University with an excellent Milton scholar, Phil Donnelly. 
In fact, I, I saw some Canadian people here. Um, I think uh, Phil Donnelly and Dennis Danielson have very um, strong Canadian connections. I still refer to this book and I highly uh, recommend this Parallel Prose edition. It can just help you understand what's going on as you read it. Um, without just discarding the poem itself. It's a, it's a guide into, it's a way into the poem. C.S. Lewis was blown away by Paradise Lost. About a hundred years ago in a letter to a friend, he said, I have finished Paradise Lost again. This is, I think he's like age 20 around this time. And um, he hasn't, uh, I, I don't think he's quite gone to college yet. He hasn't gone to Oxford yet. And he's writing uh, to a friend and he says, I enjoyed it even more the second time. Really, you must read it sometime soon. And this is golden here. In Milton is everything you get everywhere else, only better. He's as voluptuous as Keats, as romantic as Morris, as grand as Wagner, as weird as Poe, probably with all of the connotations of the word weird there and a better lover of nature than even the Brontes. That's a pretty high praise from the pre-converted C.S. Lewis. There's another 20th century literary critic, Northrop Fry, I think he's also Canadian, um, who says that Paradise Lost is the story of all things. And then just a few years ago, a Harvard professor wrote that Paradise Lost is the greatest poem in the English language, and he's not the only one to say that. Um, these are just a few folks in the last hundred years who have kind of gushed about the immense value and glory of Paradise Lost. Well, here's a structure. Maybe this will be helpful for you as you try to think about the parts of the epic. Books one and two occur in hell. Book three is set in heaven. Book four happens on earth. And in books five through eight, an archangel named Raphael visits our first parents in Eden and tells them stories and has conversations with them to prepare them to withstand temptation. Specifically within that inset narrative, book six is about the angelic war in heaven. And book seven is the story of creation. Then in book nine, we get the fall. In book 10, we see the consequences of the fall and then reconciliation. And finally, in books 11 and 12, another archangel named Michael provides a story of redemptive history before ushering Adam and Eve out of paradise. So, you ready? Let's get into book one. Book one begins with a prologue that includes a unique invocation to the muse. Maybe you've heard this if you studied epic poetry. An invocation to the muse is a calling for divine aid in the poetic venture. And this is conventional for epic literature. The nine muses were goddesses of the arts and sciences. And specifically, Calliope was the muse of epic poetry. And Milton is writing an epic poem. But it's interesting that he does not appeal to Calliope. He doesn't invoke. Calliope's aid, he appeals to a better muse, the Holy Spirit. And he says that his epic will be superior to all other epics. It's kind of like Vicini in The Princess Bride. Maybe you remember that line. Milton's basically saying, ever heard of Homer, Virgil, Ovid, morons? Except Milton, I don't think, had a lisp. Milton is clear in his prologue that his argument is to justify the ways of God to men. So we have to keep that in mind as we go through the epic. What is Milton saying or showing us about the nature of true justice and not merely the appearance of justice? What does true justice look like? Well, as Milton hastens into the midst of things, we are introduced right away to the appearance of a very grand figure, majestic, heroic, even godlike. And this is the fallen angel, Satan, who has just fallen from heaven. He fell for nine days through chaos and landed in hell, which is not in the middle of the earth where Dante has it in the inferno. 
Book one is one of the best known books of Paradise Lost, which um, can be kind of problematic because readers might get only a glimpse of, of Satan's apparent grandeur. Some people like to talk about Milton and various heresies. You want to talk about heresy. Heresy is assigning only book one of Paradise Lost um, and skipping the rest of the books. How dare you? Don't you dare. Um, showing a more traditional form of heroism is Milton's way of preparing readers to encounter a different and truer form of heroism. And you miss that if you read only the first book. So after gathering his demonic forces together, Satan essentially asks, who could have guessed that a force like ours could have been defeated by the omnipotent God, which really reveals Satan's arrogance here, despite his apparent grandeur. Seriously, you're going to ask, who could have guessed that God would win? Um, every, everybody, everybody, Satan. And the devils build a palace and they call it pandemonium. You've probably heard that word before. Milton coined the word pandemonium here in book one in Paradise Lost. And the word means all the demons. Sounds like a hashtag, all the demons. Book two. In book two, we continue in hell with an infernal council. Several demons make speeches about what course of action they should take with Beelzebub eventually suggesting that they find the newly created world and the race of men and destroy it, or at least subvert it. Satan volunteers to take on this dangerous mission and he's hailed by the demons as a god, which is exactly what he wanted. On his journey out of hell, Satan has to pass the characters of sin and death who guard the gates of hell and he eventually has to ask for directions at the throne of chaos, which is a very creepy scene. We, still, we see Milton's skill here in creating suspense because readers know that Satan is making his way toward Earth. And yet book three moves us to a different location with different characters. In book three, we transition from hell to heaven. You may remember that in Virgil's Aeneid, Virgil takes readers to hell in book six and brings them out again, which is why Dante uses Virgil to help him in the Inferno. It's helpful to have a guide who can get you out of hell. Milton acknowledges his own boldness in trying to go from hell to heaven, but he continues to ask for supernatural aid. And in heaven, we get something called the dialogue of heaven in which the father speaks of Satan's rage and the self-defeating nature of his revenge. God, the father asks for a redeemer. And maybe you could see a parallel between uh, Satan and God, the son um, with, with uh, some significant contrasts The God, God, the son volunteers for this mission. And then we transition back to Satan, who is still voyaging to paradise. He approaches the sun, not God the sun, but S-U-N, the sun, and transforms himself into the shape of a cherub with a little silver wand. And he asks the angel Uriel where the humans are, you know, just to be able to praise God more as he observes God's creation. And Uriel gives Satan directions. So Satan lands on a mountain in Mesopotamia and tries to figure out where this Eden is. And we transition to book four. In book four, Satan can now see Eden as he's approaching and he complains to the sun that its bright rays make him painfully aware of what he has lost in heaven. I heard someone say that this passage makes him feel sorry for Satan. And I thought, hold on, Satan has rejected the gifts of his creator, led a rebellion in high defiance against God, scorned the punishment by embracing hell, led a rebellion in high defiance, I said that, and plotting to destroy God's good creation. And yet somehow, after all of that, Satan's the victim here. There's a picture here of an artist's um, rendering of Satan viewing Eden. 
And uh, this picture appears on a Cambridge collection of essays on Paradise Lost. And I'm sorry, I, I just don't buy it. I, I, I bought the book, but I don't buy the sympathy that the authors, the, the artist is trying to evoke here. So Satan leaps over the wall and sits like a bird on the tree of life, basically acts like a peeping Tom watching Adam and Eve, and he stalks them like a lion and a tiger. The angel Uriel is concerned about this being who has recently asked him for directions, and Uriel arrives in paradise via sunbeam, of course, and speaks to Gabriel, who promises to find the intruder by dawn. Night falls, and Adam and Eve go to sleep, and two of Gabriel's angels find Satan squatting like a toad by Eve's ear as he infiltrates her dreams. And I think it's interesting to pay attention to Satan's transformation so far. He started as a beautiful angel of light in heaven. Then he appeared in book one as a fallen angel, but still magnificent. Then he was a cherub with a wand lying to Uriel. Then he took the form of a cormorant, which is a large bird. And then he appeared as a lion and a tiger. And now he looks like a toad. And we'll see that his transformations aren't over yet. So Gabriel and his forces join the other two angels. And there's a standoff that could get ugly. But Satan, who has shed his toad disguise, sees golden scales in the sky, warning him that he should choose flight over fight. So he flies away and night leaves with him as Adam and Eve wake up at the beginning of book five. And a very distressed Eve relates to Adam her dream of temptation and Adam encourages her by saying that she abhorred the experience which shows that she's pure. And Adam and Eve pray a hymn of praise to God and God hears their prayers and pities them knowing that Satan is plotting their destruction. So God summons Raphael, who is described as a sociable angel to teach Adam and Eve. And when Raphael arrives on earth, they eat a meal together and Adam asks to hear about events in heaven. And Raphael says that he'll do his best to describe spiritual matters in a physical way, but it's gonna be weird and awkward and, but Raphael begins his story by describing how the heavenly host was summoned to the father's throne and they all assemble and the son, S-O-N, is exalted as head and Lord over all the other powers of heaven. But the son's exaltation makes Satan envious and he and other rebellious angels fly to a mountain in the north parts of heaven. And at their north, uh, their night council, Satan claims that their angelic titles are now meaningless since the sun's exaltation has eclipsed them. And one of the angels named Abdiel says that Satan's words are really ungrateful and ironic since Satan is complaining about hierarchy and yet Satan has placed himself higher than his peers. And of course, Satan doesn't appreciate being contradicted, and he warns Abdiel to depart quickly before they prevent his departure. And Abdiel says he'll leave, but not out of fear. He just doesn't want to be standing there when the lightning strikes. So in book six, which is often called the war in heaven, Abdiel flies through the night and arrives back at the throne of God at dawn. And the father praises Abdiel and describes Abdiel's verbal fight with Satan as the better kind of fight. And we catch a glimpse here of one of the ways in which Milton transforms the epic genre by showing us what true heroism looks like. It's not necessarily demonstrated in physical battle. Sometimes true heroism might look like obedience. And we'll see that even more clearly in book nine. 
On the first day of the war in heaven, Abdiel meets Satan and strikes him on the helmet with his sword, pushing him backwards 10 paces. And they're separated by the mayhem. And soon Satan meets Michael, the warrior angel. Michael's blow with his sword cuts through Satan's sword and the continuation of the swing cuts off Satan's right side. But of course, being made of spirit, Satan heals quickly, but the rebel angels do have to carry him off the battlefield, which is just humiliating for Satan. And at night, after the first day, Satan calls a council and tries to encourage his troops by describing gunpowder, which they can dig out of the ground before morning and possibly give them an advantage. So on the second day, the rebel angels fire cannons using their gunpowder, uh, gunpowder, which are effective in bowling over the faithful angels, but not effective enough to win the war. Both sides of angels uproot mountains and throw them at each other, but it's basically a stalemate by the end of the second day. So on the third day, the sun, God the sun, rides forth and drives the rebel angels like goats to the wall of heaven, which opens up terrifying the rebel angels who cast themselves out into what appears to be a bottomless pit. And the sun returns triumphant, and that's the war in heaven. So Raphael concludes that story with an admonition for Adam and Eve to fear. This is a story to invoke fear and obedience. You can see the consequences of disobedience. In book seven, Adam asks Raphael about the creation of the world. And Raphael warns him about the intemperate pursuit of knowledge. Raphael's analogy is that just as eating too much food leads to gas, so pursuing knowledge without proper constraints leads to folly. And book seven really gets skipped over by many teachers, probably because it's short and familiar since Raphael goes through the six days of creation uh, that, that you see in Genesis one. But something that's very instructive about this book is its emphasis on the goodness of boundaries. The language of the days of creation here has a lot to do with separating and boundary setting. And I think Raphael's portrayal of the goodness of material boundaries is intended to persuade Adam of the goodness of ethical boundaries. These are for your good and they lead to your flourishing. In book eight, after reminding Adam of the dangers of intellectual overreaching and discussing the stars, Raphael urges Adam to tell his own story. And Adam describes how he first gained consciousness and named the angels. And then he explains how he got into a discussion with God about not having a mate. And God tests Adam, prompting him to articulate his reasons for wanting a mate. And Adam passes the test and he tells the story of first meeting Eve. And before Raphael returns to heaven, he tells Adam and Eve to be strong live happy and love. But first of all, love him whom to love is to obey, which basically means that to love God is to obey him. And the path uh, to happiness lies through obedience. In book nine, Milton turns to the tragic part of the narrative. This is the fall. But first, Milton renounces traditional heroic epics and says that his argument is more heroic because his epic is about the better fortitude of patience and heroic martyrdom, which has thus far in human history remained unsung. So he's going to do it. Satan returns to Earth. Uh, he has been kicked out, he comes back, and he enters the serpent because the serpent is naturally crafty and, you know, few people would suspect that its actions were diabolical. 
Meanwhile, Adam and Eve discuss their work of cultivating creation, which seems more than the two of them can handle. So Eve asks to work separately from Adam until noon, but Adam worries that an enemy may be hoping to separate them and may have more success in tempting them because of their separation. However, Eve argues that virtue must be tested and she sounds a lot like Milton's arguments in Areopagitica. So Adam finally relents and especially because he knows that Eve would not feel free if he forced her to stay by his side. So Eve is alone and Satan as the serpent speaks to her and flatters her as a goddess. And the serpent claims that it has already eaten the fruit and it gave him reason and then gave him speech and he still hasn't died. And that's very persuasive to Eve. In fact, echoing Eve's argument to Adam, the serpent says that, you know, Eve, we know good by knowing evil. The tree is what makes virtue virtue. If there were no opportunity for vice, then virtue doesn't really exist. So Eve eats the fruit and then gives Adam the fruit and he eats. And that doesn't really surprise anybody. You know, this isn't, I didn't need to give you a spoiler alert. Nobody's shocked, that, you know, that's what happens. And then they have lustful sex and they fall asleep. So everything's being perverted. All of these good gifts of God are being uh, turned to selfish purposes. And when they wake, Eve defends herself by saying that if she had never left Adam's side, she'd be as useless as a rib. But, um, but then she also criticizes Adam as her authority for not requiring her to stay. She says that if he had been more firm, this wouldn't have happened. And Adam cannot believe it. He, he actually isn't even speaking to Eve at this point. I think he's just like, unbelievable. And he's not speaking to anyone in particular. And he says, um, a man is asking for trouble if he lets a woman have her way because... She won't tolerate restraint, but if she's allowed to have her way and something bad happens, then she'll blame the man for not being a better leader. And they just continue back and forth, accusing each other, blaming each other, and never themselves. And there's no end in sight. And God knows. So in heaven, the fall is known because nothing escapes God. And God the Son promises to temper justice with mercy. And he comes to the garden to judge Adam and Eve and pronounces judgment on the serpent first and then Eve and finally on Adam and then returns to heaven and intercedes for the humans. Meanwhile, death has smelled the change in the air. It's a very disturbing image of death, almost like this bear, like large dog, and he snuffs the air and he knows now I can feed. And he and Sin build a two-way bridge from hell to earth. When Satan returns to pandemonium, he walks through the demon's ranks in disguise until his big reveal, he's sitting on a throne and he's so proud of his success, and his final lines of the epic are to the demons, and he says, what's left for us, O oh, you gods, but simply to enter into full bliss. And you can even hear the hissing in the word bliss. And what happens is that he and all the other demons transform involuntarily into serpents temporarily, and that's the last we see Satan in Paradise Lost. Back on Earth, Adam is having a difficult time, and at one point he complains, did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee? I could ask in the chat, does that sound familiar to anybody? Where does that come from? Uh, where have you seen that before? Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? It's like an angsty teenager whining, I didn't ask to be born. Well, uh, maybe you have guessed, but about 150 years later, Mary Shelley 
uses these lines from Paradise Lost as the epigraph for her novel, Frankenstein. I didn't ask for this, the monster says. Adam is furious with Eve and he won't listen to her until she falls to the ground and clasps his knees, claiming that it was all her fault, which of course it was not. And she begs for his forgiveness. And this action softens Adam's heart. And the book ends with Adam and Eve weeping and praying together for forgiveness. In book 11, Adam and Eve pray with regenerated hearts and their prayers reach the father's throne. And the son asks the father to accept the son's future satisfaction of the father's wrath, his just wrath toward uh, sin, which is destructive and leads to death. And the father accepts. And the angel Michael is tasked with taking cherubim to Eden and driving out the humans. There's kind of a funny moment when Adam sees Michael approaching them with a sword and a spear. And Adam basically leans over to Eve and says, you don't think this angel's going to be as sociable as Raphael. And uh, he is not. He shows Adam several visions of what will happen in the future, including Cain's murder of Abel, all the way up to Noah and the flood. So it's pretty bleak at first, and Adam falls into despair. But Michael mentions Noah's faithfulness and encourages Adam to see what happened after the flood, which gets us to the final book. We made it. Michael now narrates redemptive history because the visions have worn out Adam. And Michael's story covers the account of Abraham all the way up to the Messiah. And you can see Moses there giving the law. When Adam hears about the Messiah who will crush the serpent's head, his despair turns into presumption. And Michael says, dream not of their fight. In other words, redemption isn't going to look like a cage fight. In fact, redemption is going to look like losing at first. And you need to know that. You need to be prepared for that. Michael describes Christ's incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection and ascension. And he explains that sin and death will be destroyed one day when Christ returns. And Adam has a very interesting moment where he almost wonders if he should repent since so much goodwill toward men, not to mention the glory of God, is the result of his sin. Some scholars call this passage a Felix culpa passage, which means a fortunate fall. That's a doctrine that is a paradoxical uh, way of viewing Adam's sin in a fortunate way because of the unique blessings of redemption, which maybe we wouldn't have had any other way. Um, some scholars don't see Adam's statement as a Felix culpa, but I've got an essay, a chapter in this book uh, in which I argue that while Milton may not affirm the Felix Culpa personally as the, the author of Paradise Lost, I think Adam does affirm it. I think Milton is showing Adam to be presumptuous here. And uh, eventually Adam does recognize that obedience is best, but um, I, I do think it's a Felix Culpa. Eve, interestingly, gets the final lines of dialogue in the epic and basically explains the gospel, which consoles her, even as she and Adam are being driven out of the only home they've ever known. Eve says, though all by me is lost, such favor I unworthy am vouchsafed. Through me, by me, the promised seed shall all restore. And there's a picture here showing Mary comforting Eve. It's the seed of the woman which will crush the head of the serpent. And the epic ends with Adam and Eve wiping a few tears and hand in hand, they walk out into the world with God sustaining them. And that is a quick guide through the greatest poem in the English language. So thanks for spending your time with me today.
that's it. Thank you so much, Professor Larson. That You're was, welcome. That was wonderful. I actually brought my uh, brought my coffee today. All right. Thought it was right. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite things is buying used books because yeah. finding what notes people have written in them is kind of fun for me. So it's yes, I loved. Um, but I I really enjoyed that refresher. And now is a time for Q and A. So if there's any attendees that have questions about Professor Larson's talk, please put those in the chat. There's there's the chat and then there's the Q&A. So <laughs> you can really use either. Um, just make sure if you're asking a question in the chat, it's to all panelists. Um, I guess it can be and attendees, but as long as the panelists see it, that's important. So looks like we have a question already in Q&A from Hope and she asks, is this poem the major source of theories regarding Satan's fall? <laughs> I would love to study that further. Um, I have heard people say that. Yeah. So how many falls are there? How many falls does the Bible talk about? I'm, I'm kind of out of my depth here, but um, I know Michael Heiser is a scholar who has talked about how Milton has influenced uh, kind of a popular understanding of the fall. Um, so, you know, I don't know if he's completely accurate on that, but at least he's one place where he's talking about um, kind of the, you know, the results of Milton's version of the fall. Yeah. I have a question for you, Professor Larson. Yes. I'm, I'm very curious what your dissertation was on because you said it was on. Oh, Paris that's law. great. Yes. So um, the, the book that I showed you, I have two chapters in there and there are, um, uh, those two chapters are some chapters from my dissertation. The dissertation is on rhetoric and virtue in Paradise Lost. And I look at the passages that often get skipped over, I think, books five through eight and books 11 through 12 are the angelic books where Raphael is educating Adam and Eve and Michael is uh, encouraging them and going over redemptive history. So it's interesting to look at the role of angels as teachers and how they use rhetoric um, um, uh, to inculcate uh, particular virtues. I look at the virtue of temperance in several chapters, the virtue of fortitude, um, get a little bit into uh, um, justice and wisdom. So yeah, rhetoric and virtue in Paradise Lost. That's wonderful. Well, thank yeah. you for sharing. Uh, and looks like we have another question in the chat. Uh, is Paradise Lost the last great epic? And if so, why hasn't there been another great <laughs> epic in so long and really done by an American poet, right? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's, there's one scholar who said that Milton perfected the epic genre and thereby killed it. <laughs> Nobody else has been able to do something like this. You know, there are other long works of poetry. You know, you have... Um, uh, Wordsworth, the prelude, and and you have um, you know Longfellow's uh, Hiawatha, and um, I even encountered. There's an American. Um, it's it's like a Western. I've got it on my shelf here somewhere, but uh, I I can't recall the title. But it's several uh, Western stories, which sounds kind of you know like an American epic. But um, nothing has the popularity of, you know, Homer, Virgil, um, Dante, Spencer, Milton. And after Milton, it's like, uh, that's kind of it. Well, I, I have one last question for you. And if there are any other questions, I think we'll then hear a little something from, oh, we have one more. Is Milton required reading at Regent? No, should be though, right? <laughs> There is a class uh, in the general education, um, uh, the core curriculum, and that class covers uh, Western literature and Milton is not part of the, uh, the curriculum for that course. Um, so yeah, he's, he's not part of it, but I sneak in Milton wherever I can. So if you take me, you'll get Milton. Well, I think this is a wonderful transition. Thank you so much, Professor Larson. This Good, you're welcome. Happy to do it. So much. And I know Nicole is here. She's going to share with us 
about Regent University. So Nicole, whenever you're ready, feel free to hop on. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I just wanted to quickly jump on and take a couple of minutes um, to discuss a couple of opportunities for you um, at Regent. But like she was saying, my name is Nicole Jackson. I'm one of the enrollment coordinators um, at Regent University. Um, so my job is basically kind of just to talk to you a little bit about Regent and what you can get um, as part of your education um, with us. So um, briefly just wanted to touch base on two things that are both an opportunity for you um, before you complete high school. And then if you decided that you wanted to um, come to Regent University for your undergrad, um, the first thing is going to be our early college program and then the second thing is going to be our honors college so the first thing i want to talk about um, is early college and i'm actually going to share my screen and actually just go to the website um, because everything is on there um, and that's super helpful so if you're like man what did nicole say um i'll just take you right to it so let me go ahead and share that Okay, so like I was saying, early college is Regent University's dual enrollment opportunity. So it's a way that, you know, you don't have to wait until you graduate high school to start taking college level courses with us. Um, they are fully online, so you do not need to be in Virginia Beach uh, to do the classes with us. Um, they're eight weeks long. Um, and it's designed to be more of a part-time opportunity that you take alongside your high school courses. So if you look here, um, this is, I'm gonna share this in the chat as well, but these are the course options that we have. They're all general education requirements for the most part um, that you would take and you know earn some college level uh, credit you know, while you're um, still in high school. So this is all on the website. Like I said, I'll share this in the chat. Um, the requirements for our early college program are that you need to at least complete your sophomore year of high school um, and then have at least a 3.0 GPA. Um, and then you could apply for the early college program. A benefit to doing the program with us is we have something called a rewarding educational performance award. So what that means is that if you take classes with us your junior and senior year and you perform and get a B or higher in the class, if you decide to come to Regent uh, as an on-campus student for your undergrad, the money that you spent on the classes, we will actually honor back to you in a scholarship your first semester at Regent. Um, so it's just something to kind of keep in mind, you know, if you're putting in the work, we obviously want to, um, you know, award that, that to you. Um, and then if you decide that you want it to go elsewhere, like I said, these are general education requirements that you'll probably have to take wherever you go. Um, so you can definitely bring the credits with you. So that's a little bit about that. Um, let me go ahead and stop sharing that. I will drop that in the chat for you, the direct link to this. Um, so if you're like, wanted to look through that again, I'll put that in there for you now. And then the second thing that I wanted to just quickly go through with you is our honors college. Um, and like I said, this is all on the website, so feel free to take a browse through here as well. Um, so the Honors College is an opportunity that you can do uh, starting your freshman year at Regent during your uh, on-campus undergrad. Um, so you would have to be on campus in Virginia. Um, you would apply for this program um, during your senior year of high school, and then you would start your freshman year. So it's a, a cohort that you would start then. Um, there's a separate application that you would need to submit. So once you are an admitted student into Regent University, you would then apply for the Honors College program. Um, there's a couple of different requirements for this program. Um, you need to have at least a 3.7 GPA, um, SAT about a 1250, ACT about a 26, um, in order to uh, apply for this program and be eligible. Um, it's composed of students across you know, all domains and programs. So there's not necessarily like a specific program you need to be a part of to do the honors program. You can be in any undergraduate major and, and join the honors college. Um, there are five specific honors classes that you would take, which is actually what I put up here for you to see. Um, and you would take these throughout your entire undergrad. So you would swap out um, the minor that you have and it would be replaced with these 
five honors classes. And that gives you just a little bit of an overview of what those classes are, um, you know, how that would kind of look integrated into your, into your program. Um, and then if you decide to do the Honors College, um, it's an additional scholarship opportunity for you as well. And then we also have a full tuition scholarship opportunity called Honors Bound, which I will go ahead and link uh, into the chat for you. And I'll also include our undergraduate admissions uh, office email and my email um, if you wanted to reach out after this is done. If you have some questions that pop up, definitely feel free um, to reach out. Honors College is not necessarily something you have to do. It's just an opportunity that we do have. So even if you decided not to, you are still receiving an excellent education from an award-winning uh, undergraduate curriculum. So this is just something else that we do offer for our students. Um, but either way, you'll be receiving an excellent education. So I will go ahead and leave that there and drop this into the chat as well. Um, I know we are a little bit over our time, but... That was wonderful, Nicole. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, I also copied and pasted the link again because I think you sent it to me privately. So wanted the world to know, not just <laughs> so sorry. Not the thank you. knowledge of Regent, but thank you for sharing. I just, I think that's so awesome. Especially the thing about the scholarships that you honor that money spent for the classes. I wish that had been the case for my dual enrollment classes in high school. I know my parents would have loved that. So it's really cool. Yeah, that, that's really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing about that. And just a big thanks to Regent and again to Professor Larson. Thank you both for being here today and um, sharing about Regent, sharing about Milton. Um, any last words before we hop off the seminar tonight? I uh, have taught a number of Honors College students uh, in special uh, tutorial sessions, and uh, the Honors College students at Regent are really, really sharp. So uh, if you'd like to be around other sharp kids and uh, studying great literature, um, great subjects, Regent's a good place to go. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I really enjoyed it and I'm sure everybody else did too. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye.